This is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob. Topic 12, Marketing Channels and Supply Chain Management. Hey folks, you, you got a special one here today. In this topic, I am going to go through in one topic, both of Dr. Keller's courses in Logistics and Supply Chain. So we'll have a, have a busy time in this one. Um, now, a couple of quick little explanation terms here, classification terms, what do I mean here? Supply chain, that's everything involved in moving materials to and within the production facility. Then marketing channels or channel distribution is everything involved in moving the uh, final product from the production facility to the final uh, consumer. And of course, the two together are logistics. Now a few intro comments on this thing here. You're never gonna develop any of your product strategies in isolation. You're gonna consider all the, the four Ps in synergy and, uh, and especially uh, place and distribution. We previously noted uh, Coca-Cola getting into the wine business. Everything looked great except you can't execute it in the place of, uh, in the place of purchase overall. And uh, another thing too to consider in this, in you making your distribution decisions, you can eliminate the channel members, but you cannot eliminate the functions they perform. So if you hear some store someplace uh, trying to say to you, well, we've eliminated the middleman. Uh, no, you haven't. You, are, you haven't eliminated the middleman. You're performing the functions that the middleman would normally have performed yourself. Now, here's what's very interesting on this. In the old USSR, they didn't want middlemen. They were considered parasites. They were talking about speculators. They would get a trip to the gulag. Well, think about it now. Winn-Dixie is a speculator when you come right down to it. They buy a product for a dollar, put it on the shelf, and sell it for a dollar twenty-nine. It's speculation to a point. Oh, the old USSR, you couldn't have that. So you have a dairy someplace, and they're basically running their dairy store somewhere. So you'd have to stand in line at the dairy store to get your cheese and milk and stuff like that. Then you got another, another store, the meat store. So you, they're, they're producing the meat and stuff, and you'd have to go to the meat store and get that stuff. Then you go in some other place that they're, they're doing, building groceries and stuff like this, and uh, vegetables. So you got to go to the vegetable store and stand in line there all day. Holy mackerel. You're taking a day just to go and one store to the other. Oh, wait a second. These so-called speculators, they perform very valuable functions, folks. I would, I'm happy to go to Winn-Dixie. Let them make their profit margin so I can get in and out in 30 minutes and, uh, and get my shopping all done. So let's think about the channel functions and what exactly is done in the, in the channels. Consistent with the theme that we've talked about throughout this course, there is a tendency to outsource your logistical functions to specialists. Uh, an example, it's just an example of the specialization and division of labor. And as we've said throughout this whole course, everybody does what they do best and you outsource the rest. Now channel members then can overcome a lot of discrepancies in, in the supply chain, the marketing channels, or both. We got, first of all, we got discrepancies of quantity. So we have the issue of accumulating. So what someone in the, the chain does is they buy up smaller com uh, quantities someplace and sell it in large. So I've got, um, I got some people at Orange Groves down in central Florida. And, uh, well, Minute Maid only wants to buy a whole truckload. So they, they'll think, well, some outsourcer will come over there and they'll buy half a truckload from this guy and put it on. They'll buy a quarter truckload from somebody else, put it on, buy another quarter load from somebody else, and they can then take it to Minute Maid. That's a valuable function. So they're not going to pay the groves as much as, the, as they get paid by Minute Maid, fine, it's well worth it. Another thing too, same idea in this whole thing. If I'm running a grove here, chances are I don't need to invest in the trucks I'm only going to use for a few days all year, outsource that whole thing and, and have somebody else, even if I got a full truckload going in there, fine, outsource it, let somebody else pick them up. I don't have to invest in all the equipment and all that stuff. Bulk breaking then, that's the flip side of it. I'm buying and producing in large quantities, and then I want to sell them in smaller quantities. So going back to my oranges here, I repackage this whole, uh, this whole truckload full of oranges, uh, selling in five pound bags on pallets, and that, sell that into the retail stores. Then I have discrepancies of assortment. That's what I was getting down to when we were talking about what you have when you go to the store. Uh, discrepancies of assortment says I'm going to combine my uh, products from several to many sources to be available at one convenient location. Um, B2B example would be a wholesaler that handles a wide variety of healthcare products uh, that are available in drug stores and, uh, and grocery stores. And then a B2C example uh, would be the drug stores and the grocery stores themselves. 
Then you have temporal or time discrepancy. There's a difference in time between when something is produced and when it's needed. So take the holidays. I got seasonal sportswear and Christmas decorations. OK, I don't need them on the shelves but about a couple months a year. But I'm going to produce them year round. I'm not going to have a factory that only works two months a year. So I'm producing full, full year round. Well, I produce the stuff in January or so. I don't, the stores don't need it yet. Well, I need, I need to warehouse it. Yeah, but why would I have my own warehouse when it would be dead empty the first of January and then it only gets full by about the, uh, the end of October or something like that? You outsource that whole thing there because it's a, it's a discrepancy. We don't need it there. Contact efficiency. This is, a, this is a very interesting concept on the issue of contact efficiency. It's fundamentally more efficient in terms of reducing the number of contact points and, and, and transactions for manufacturers and individual producers to distribute through intermediaries and for the individual customers to then buy from that retailer. So they sell it in the Best Buy and you go to Best Buy. That's exactly the opposite, of course, of the e-commerce model where they sell direct to you. Now, the e-commerce model is not as efficient in terms of simple numbers of transactions. They have to have an individual contact point for every customer. But they have the advantage of personalization. They have the advantage of control. So you kind of balance it off as to what works for you. On, on contact efficiency and all, um, in some cases, you've got to have a direct channel. You don't have any choice. You've got ice cream, milk. I can't ship it through the warehouse. I've got to deliver it to the store, refrigerated. But also, other direct store delivery, Coca-Cola. Well, Coca-Cola, come on. Wouldn't it be much more efficient for Coca-Cola to just ship product through the people's warehouse instead of actually delivering it right to the store? It might be more efficient, but think about it. That Coca-Cola guy's in that store three days a week, going in there, merchandising the product, building the displays, putting pricing point of sale on them. Uh, regularly building the size of the beverage department a little foot at a time here and there. So here again, it's not as efficient to send your product uh, just to, through, the, through the truck delivering to the store uh, three days a week, but there's other advantages to that as well. So like a, a lot of other things we have in marketing, we got to consider um, a lot of different pluses and, and minuses on different things. So let's consider some of the channel intermediaries that we have we got retailers. We'll deal with them in topic 13 specifically. And merchant wholesalers, uh, those are independently owned, and they take title to the goods they sell and distribute. So Winn-Dixie owns a product that they sell. Well, yeah. Winn-Dixie owns it, but here's the thing that makes it very interesting. I got to get back to Coke here again. Winn-Dixie, when they, the, the Coca-Cola delivers it, Winn-Dixie owns the product. Um, and so they've taken it, and they're so supposedly speculating. Mm -hmm. They're speculating, except here's the thing, they got like 30 days to pay, by which time the product's turned over about four times. So they really actually, at the end of the day, don't really have an investment uh, that they've had to make in that product because they're actually sold it before they actually have to pay for it. Um, but they do own it, they do own it, even though they haven't yet paid for it. And most of these merchant wholesalers uh, and the grocery stores, by definition, of course, take possession of the goods they sell. An exception to that, interesting one, drop shippers. Drop shippers, um, merchant wholesaler, they take the order, uh, they have the producer and supplier ship it direct to the buyer without taking possession of it. This is something they do for bulky commodities like coal, non-perishable agricultural products. Say you get a coal mine. You get a coal mine in West Virginia. You load the stuff on a train. Uh, you got that thing, it's 100, it's 100 cars long, the train is full. You're not letting it sit in the sidelines. You send it west. You got no idea where it's going to go. That thing is, it's going west, and it gets to about central Ohio, gets about Columbus, and a drop shipper contacts. He said, I need 40, 40 cars. Send them down to Cincinnati. Detach the 40 cars, they own them, they send them down to, send them down to Cincinnati. Thing keeps going west. Uh, it gets to about Indianapolis. Hey, drop shipper calls out. I need 30 train cars. Send them up to Gary. Fine, they detach it, send 30 cars up to Gary. Send the other 30 cars, they keep going west. Of course, it makes sense. There's no reason for that wholesaler to take physical possession of the coal. Doesn't make sense. But they just take the ownership and wind up directing it overall. Um, another very interesting breed of uh, merchant wholesaler, a rack jobber. It's in response to um, scrambled merchandising. We'll talk more about that in, uh, in chapter 13, uh, topic 13, um, which basically what we're saying is we're basically the, the rack jobbers handle certain segments of the, of the store, certain products in the store that um, the chain management does not, doesn't want to mess with. 
like greeting cards. They don't want to mess with greeting cards. They basically, it's, it, Halloween's done. They do not want to have to take the Halloween cards off the shelf and put them in the back room someplace and bring them up. They rent the space out to a rack jobber. They handle the, the stuff on pegs, the kitchenware, stuff like that. They don't want to mess with it. So just let a rack jobber handle the whole thing like this. Um, agents and brokers, uh, they're facilitators who um, handle the selling and negotiating functions, uh, bring buyers and sellers together, but they do not take ownership when you think about agent broker. Real estate agent would be one. So let's consider some of the um, consumer product channels that we might possibly be dealing with. And the question here is, who are you going to use in this? Are you going to go direct straight to the consumer? Going to go through a retailer? You're going to go through a wholesaler first and then to a retailer? Uh, you're going to use your own sales force or your own agent broker? There's a whole, whole bunch of different ways you might be able to do this thing. Uh, now, in this, in, in deciding which way you're going to do it, sometimes you, you make the channel decisions. Sometimes they're imposed upon you. For example, the beer companies cannot vertically integrate and sell directly to the stores. They must go through an independent wholesaler. And then, basically, the, the, basically you then have got to go from them to the retail store that their wholesaler delivers to. You cannot buy from the wholesaler and all that. We had an interesting case happen in Athens uh, when I was up at the University of Georgia. Uh, the rugby team up there had a basic party, a 100 kegger. So anyhow, they want to go to, they want to go down to the wholesaler and say, we need 100 kegs. Wholesaler says, I, guys, can't do it. Can't do it. Even though I got, I got, got 100 kegs sitting right here for it, I can't do it. Because I'm not allowed to sell to you. So what I got to do is that we're going to have to have an order. We're going to have to 100, take 100 kegs out and drop it to, to one of our retailers, and you're going to have to get it from the retailer. Uh, on a smaller scale, we had someone up there one time went into a store and said, hey, I need, uh, we need four cases of Budweiser. We've got a poker game tonight. And the store manager says, you're in luck. The Bud guy is sitting right here. Let me just uh, get him right along here and uh, take care of you guys. So hey, Harry, uh, load uh, four cases of Bud on the back of this guy's pickup truck here. Busted. Mm -mm. Can't do it. Can't do it. The bud guy has got to take the product, take it on, and drop it on the floor of the store. Then the store employee or you, the customer, can pick it up off the store. That is required. Now, let's get in the Coca-Cola bottler system. Um, let's say that you have yourself a little, uh, little store here in, uh, in Pensacola, and you're thinking about you're going to buy some Coca-Cola. And your local Coca-Cola bottler is selling cans that say $6 a case. But in Mobile over there, the Mobile Coca-Cola bottler says, hey, I'll sell it at $5 a case and deliver it right to your door. Same deal. So uh, where are you going to buy your Coca-Cola? You think Mobile? It's cheap, five bucks to the six? No, you ain't. You're buying a Pensacola because they have an exclusive distribution territory there. You must buy it. Mobile cannot sell it across their territory lines. Very interesting how that all came about. There's a little Coca-Cola bottler uh, in north of, uh, north of Los Angeles, Taft, California. Uh, they basically decided they were going to build a can plant, a can plant in a tiny town like this. They're going after L.A. Coke, because L.A. Coke has always run this as a high price product. They never promote. They have one of the lowest market shares for Coca-Cola in the nation, uh, like an 8 or 10 share of market for the brand. But they don't care. They're never not going to promote the thing at all in this. Taft comes in, and they go to Albertsons and Ralph's and Safeway and some of the chains out there in greater L.A., and they say, hey, we'll, we'll undercut. L.A. Coca-Cola buy a buck a case and deliver right to your door. L.A. Coca-Cola sues them and says, oh no, we've got the exclusive territory franchise. They've got to buy from us. This thing went to the Supreme Court, and I think like 1969, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of L.A. Coca-Cola and, and sustained their right to an exclusive territory, uh, saying that the bottling system has served the public well for a number of years. I, I wonder if they were to go back and revisit that case today if they might talk about restraint and trade. Don't know. But in any case, you're restricted on where you can buy this product. But so anyhow, in a nutshell, what we're coming down to in all this, either you're going to perform all the distribution functions yourself, you know, direct channels such as 800 number, catalogs, e-commerce business model, or you're going to utilize intermediaries or specialists to handle some or all of the functions. And all this involves a, a, a lot of factors like how complex is your product, how much need is there for one-on-one -on -one contact? Your ability to manage a sales force. If you can't manage a sales force, you're going to have to go through an agent broker channel. Because very simply, I've got a, I've got a small business right here. I want to get my product distributed in Seattle. I, can't, I haven't got a way to make a sales call in Seattle. The chains aren't going to talk to me anyhow. I can't get an appointment. I've got to go through agent broker. 
Um, and the other question is on this thing, what level of uh, distribution intensity do you want? And a number of different levels of distribution intensity could, uh, could range from intensive, selective, or exclusive. And this is going to depend a lot on the nature of the product. Intensive distribution, I'm saying I want this product everywhere that, um, that customers may be inclined to buy. So convenience products like bre bread and butter, impulse items like pop and snacks, I want them every place. Um, selective, I'm having there a limited number of outlets that will give the product special attention or create a superior product image. Panasonic TV uh, only wants to be available in dealers with a quality image and an ability to service it. They do not want to be in Walgreens. You might get a TV set at Walgreens, you won't get a Panasonic. Floor Shine Shoes, uh, they want to be in the finer stores, they don't want to be in Kmart. We had recently a uh, fashion clothier um, who took the attitude, oh, we, we don't want to just have this, um, this selective distribution, we want to really get out there. And so they were just in the finer stores and decided, well, we're just going to go ahead and sell at Kmart. The finer stores said, hey, you selling Kmart? That's fine, you're not selling here anymore, buddy. Uh, similar thing when uh, P&G had IAM's pet food only available at dealers, at, 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 at breeders and vets and all that stuff. Um, yeah, uh, that, was a, that was pretty restrictive and they could have command a higher price, but they decided then to make it available in stores. Breeders and vets guys say, well, what's the point of us carrying it? We can't match these guys in price. You're out of here. That was the end of that. Now, exclusive distribution, most restrictive, one or at most a very few uh, outlets in a given area, specialty goods, that people will go way out of their way for. Rolex, very top end uh, home furnishings, fashion accessories, and the like. Now, out of all this, we have the question of um, channel power, control, and leadership. And basically, what we're saying here is in channel relationships, as in life generally, um, everybody is out to get what's in their own best interest. So we're looking at channel power, channel control, and exactly what can we get done in this. Um, everybody basically, we're saying, is out to get what's in their own best interest in the world. Yeah, fine. I know there's no problem with that. But the more power you have, or are perceived as having, uh, the more favorable the outcome is going to be. So the big guys, Walmart on the retailer end, Procter & Gamble on the producer end, are in a whole lot better position to impose their will on others than are the little guys, the Kmarts and the Lever Brothers of the world. But, of course, it is in everyone's best interest to work together in a partnership to achieve shared objectives. Now, with all of this, there's a function which has major implications for efficiency and costs in both the manufacturing and retailing end of it, and that's inventory control, minimizing the inventory levels while maintaining an adequate supply to meet the, the customer manufacturing requirements. These are two objectives that are in exact cross purposes. If I want to have lots of inventory so it's always available, I got to carry a whole bunch of inventory and cost me money. Let's consider just-in-time manufacturing uh, from the manufacturing end of the business. And that's got an invent inventory system in which the inventory arrives exactly when it's needed. In the old days, they used to have inventory, oh, they have a couple of weeks worth of inventory on the automobile manufacturing sites and just bring the stuff on as it's needed. They don't do that anymore. They don't need all that warehouse space. They don't need all that money tied up in inventory. They've got, oh, three or four times a shift. Another shipment of the goods comes in and it gets in just exactly when it's needed. So I'm going to reduce my inventory. I'm going to have to have much more frequent deliveries. This sounds great and efficient in terms of money tied up and, uh, and, and not having to have as much space and all this, but you are vulnerable in case of delays, strikes, or acts of nature. Then we have on the, on, the, on the retail end of the business, inventory control, same sort of thing, um, where I've got to balance the cost of carrying my inventory vis-a-vis um, -vis lost business and lower customer satisfaction for being out of, out of stock. Looking at inventory control, here's an interesting thing to, uh, to note in the case that I've dealt with personally. Um, going down to Schottenkirk Honda, and, um, and, and they basically uh, used to have the attitude that, well, we're going to have ourselves uh, inventory for maybe, oh, any, any Honda or Acura car that's ever been made. Well, here's the problem you got, guys. Um, I, got, I, I got a problem here in that, let's just say, oh, I've got myself a 1991 NSX, and I need the... Uh, the, the little computer module that goes in for, for the air conditioning and heating systems. It's a, it's a $2,000 part, which is the, the size of a, of a very small uh, iPhone. Yeah, how often do you think that part might, uh, might be called upon? 
and, and that dealership. Uh, very seldom. Is it worthwhile keeping that in inventory and the cost of your inventory? Probably not. Probably not at all. Um, so what do they do? That part is not available in the United States. It's only available in Japan. If you need that part, they'll ship it overnight. That's simple enough. But then again, a customer goes in, well, we'll have your car ready. We have it done tomorrow. We can't do it today. Yeah, but Schottenkirk, now Pensacola Honda. Instead of carrying $10 million of inventory, can do with $2 million worth of inventory. And occasionally, a customer's not, not going to have that part available today. But the difference, $8 million worth of inventory, if the carrying costs are 6%, it's costing you $480,000 a year to carry that inventory. Um, that's an expensive piece of business for that balance of customer satisfaction. Let's consider inventory, in term, inventory control in terms of um, my 1979 Cutlass. Uh, when, I bought, when I bought the Cutlass in 79, it was all line item. You could order anything that you wanted to on it. Um, and I, one item at a time, do you want the heavy duty radiator? Yes, I do, and all that. Then another item comes up. The 80 amp alternator, yeah, I want the 80 amp instead of the 70 amp alternator. It's like 12 bucks more, fine, give, give me that. That's all well and good. Except one little thing with this. The housing, the brackets on the housing on the car will not accommodate a 70 amp alternator. You've got to replace it with an 80 amp alternator. So I'm up in Chicago a few years back, and I'm driving around up there, and all of a sudden I notice my voltmeter is kind of sitting normally about 14, kind of quivers a little bit and drops back down to 12, and sits there for a while, and quivers a little bit and moves back to 14. Keep doing this. Kind of tells you, yeah, alternator's fixing to go. So right on where mom and dad were living, I, there, was, there was a Napa place, and I checked in with them. And uh, yeah, they verified, yeah, your alternator's fixing to go, all that. So guess how many 80-amp alternators for a 1979 Cutlass there are in greater metro Chicago? There's one. It's in Gary. Not a problem. Get on the phone, truck delivers it up, they have it in that very same day. But now there's none. Now there's none in Metro Chicago. Now the nearest one's in Omaha. So if someone tomorrow needs an 80 amp alternator for 79 Cutlass, they don't have one. So maybe they should keep two in inventory? Mm, no, probably not. No, just it's on the remote possibility that someone comes in in the next day or two and needs one of these things for a 79 Cutlass, it's going to take us a couple days to get it in. It's sort of like the old story of someone goes up to the, to the parts department at a, at a car dealership and says, have you got such and such a car part? And the guy says, yeah, I've got exactly one. And the guy says, good, I'll take it. And the parts manager says, I can't sell it to you. And the guy says, why can't you sell it to me? He says, because if I sell it to you, I'll be out of inventory. <sighs> yeah, you're going to be out of inventory on occasion. That's the whole balancing act that you have on this thing. Now, the thing to think about on this whole thing, whether you're manufacturing or retailing, either, either way here, the objective of any materials handling system is to move items as quickly as possible through the system with minimum handling. Oh, has Walmart done this right with their distribution center concept? Um, old days, what you do, again, trucks would come into the distribution center, they'd unload them, put them on the forklifts, put them on the shelf, they need them, take the forklift out, put it on the shelf, and get it off the shelf again, put it on the truck, no, oh no, Walmart doesn't do that. That stuff comes in, say Panasonic, or someone, Panasonic doesn't sell at Walmart, but some, some TV company send, sending TV sets. They're going to, um, they want to they, they have a delivery going into the, uh, in, into the system there, into the distribution center. Uh, that truck just pulls up there. They pull up, Walmart, get the little forklift down there. They take it off the truck and immediately put it on a truck going to Pensacola. Got another, another forklift, gets, gets another pallet. That one's going to truck going to Panama City. No double handling. Can you imagine the efficiency of that? You wonder why uh, Keller's logistics guys make the kind of money they do for figuring out how to get this sort of thing done. Which brings us finally to transportation and some of the considerations we have on how, how are we going to get it there. Now, consistent with this whole philosophy, I've got to balance the cost of transportation vis-a-vis -vis customer satisfaction uh, for having the quickest delivery time. I certainly cannot air freight everything. Of course not. It doesn't make any sense to air freight everything. So generally what I try to do is minimize my costs at, and this is the key, a predetermined level of customer service. Uh, I, I want them to have it within 24 hours, 98% of the time, or what have you. And I use the total cost approach. Total cost approach includes everything. It's the cost of transportation plus loss, damage, warehousing, cost of carrying, inventory, security. 
So again, this cost of carrying inventory, that's a big cost when you're dealing with a part that's called upon once every three years or something like that. So your total cost may say, no, we're not going to truck that down from Atlanta. We're just going to air freight it from, uh, from Japan. Now, here's the thing. When you consider total cost approach, air traffic might be cheaper. Think about it. What do you think would it be cheaper and go and say you got a, say you got a, uh, a shipment that's going from uh, JFK Airport to Atlantic City? It's, it's certainly going to be cheaper to put it on a truck and run it on a truck than it is to ship it by air, would it not? Unless it's, say, a box of Rolex watches. A box of Rolex, Rolex watches lands at JFK, you put it on a truck, you drive it to Atlantic City. How many times do you think you're going to do that before someone figures out what's going on and that truck gets hijacked? Mm, going down through New York City and then down the New Jersey Turnpike, I don't think it's going to take very long. No, considering total cost, risk, loss, air freight is probably the better alternative. So in considerations that you have for choosing the mode of transportation, pretty logical. Time's of the essence. I got a high value to weight ratio. I need high security. Minimum damage, Rolex watches, computer chips, live lobsters, I'm going by air. Time is somewhat important, not as important, not as high a value to weight ratio. I need door-to-door -door delivery, so I got furniture, I got agricultural products such as uh, Vidalia onions, oranges, stuff like that, I'm going by truck. Time gets to be somewhat less important, often a low value to weight ratio. Um, heavy, bulky goods going to inland areas, coal and grain, I'll go rail. Now, for products like coal and grain, if it's available in time, constraints aren't too great, I'm going with water. Now, disadvantage on, on water is it is really slow, but it is cheap, cheap, cheap. So if I've got grain in Minnesota, it's going to New Orleans. I'm not, gonna, I'm not even going to take it on a train. I'll take it on a train maybe to the head of the Mississippi River, and then I'll float it down. Coal, OK, on coal. If I've got coal wants to go to New Orleans, I'm going to take it down from West Virginia down to the Ohio River and we'll float it down. Um, now for gas and oil products like that, I'm going to use pipelines as much as possible. Um, pipelines are also very, very slow, but they are super dependable. Even a tornado ain't going to phase them, and they are super cheap, cheap, cheap. Well, that is topic 12. And this is Marketing Fundamentals with Bob.